Well, you know, she was an innocent, and she was what we all, I mean, she's the girl, even though she did smoke pot, which is such an, an an anomaly for a good girl. But the way she smokes it, you can see she's not experienced. You know, she coughs and she she sort of blows it, if you will. It was the archetype that had to be the center of that story, which is an innocent girl without boyfriends, without experience. It's this per babysitter. You know, the movie was conceived as the babysitter murders. I mean, that's how Mustafa Akkad went to John Carpenter and said, I want to make a movie about babysitters who get slashered. And it was John and Deborah who said it on Halloween night. And um, I think it was Deborah who said, let's sh have it take place on Halloween night. But it's really the innocence of babysitting coming into conflict with this evil being. And that's why the movie worked, was because she was so incredibly vulnerable. And the audience was let in on her vulnerability from the very beginning. I wish I had you all alone. Oh, poor Lori, scared another one away. You just are establishing this girl with no experience, and then, you know, you put her in peril, and it worked. She was a <clears throat> virginal character, uh, but she was extremely strong and self-directed. And, uh, you know, it was mainly Jamie's performance. I think that's what, what took us there. I think if you're good at that, I will tell you this. The scariest sequence in the new movie involves a babysitter. And it involves a babysitter who's different than Lori but also has a beautiful connection. You know, there is something beautiful about babysitting, adventures in babysitting. Babysitters are not nannies. They are local girls and boys, but local girls who parents trust will watch over their kids. A lot of those babysitters couldn't drive. You know, nowadays, all of us are like, well, if they can't drive, well, then I can't have them because we, you know what I mean? But this was like neighborhood girls coming over so the parents could go out to dinner or go to a birthday party. There's just something beautiful about the relationship between a babysitter. You're not a teacher. You're not a governess. You're not Mary Poppins. You're a peer in a weird way, you know? You're only probably eight to 10 years older than the kids you're babysitting. There's a innocence about it all, even though in the new movie, the sequence is terrifying. She's not an innocent girl. This girl clearly has, you know, this modern woman. You see, here's what happened. Laurie Strode survived a brutal assault by an unknown assailant and survived by her wits and, by the way, had her life saved by Dr. Loomis at the last minute. There was nothing for her. There was no mental health services offered. I think she went to school the next day. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think her parents were those Midwestern parents like, honey, you're okay, you got a little cut on your arm, got a Band-Aid, you know, a couple stitches. Maybe she stayed home a day. But she went back to school and she was the freak because all she was was everybody looked at her and nobody helped her and so all that happened was that she lost everything. She lost herself, she lost her friends, nobody was helping her. Everybody was saying, oh, just get on with your life. And of course that didn't happen. So then the cascading trauma just, it's like a, a tumbleweed, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so she slams into people looking for contact, men, she's married, she thing, alcoholism, drugs, all of it, with no support. She was the freak. She's the girl who survived. She's the final girl. But she's also something that you recoil from in a way. Nobody went and embraced her. And so all of the innocence is gone. And so she has had, she has been self-reliant. And the more callous that she created on herself, the farther and farther people you know, came and she had a child and they took the child away. Because can you imagine Laurie Strode going into your first grade 
you know, back to school night when all the parents are going, hi, what is the curriculum? And Lori's going, hi, what's your exit strategy? What, seriously. Now, the weird thing is, of course, today, active shooter is a term that everybody knows in school. But back in the day, there was none of that. And so, of course, Lori, who was just trying to protect her daughter, the authorities were called because what kind of life is that for a little girl? So she was taken. And again, compounded, callous, callous, callous. So the woman we meet is uh, alive by her own wits, has no friends, is the freak of the town, and lives in a compound because she is preparing herself every day for the eventuality that Michael Myers will return, and he does. She's a survivor of a night of horror, and her character in the new film is uh, riddled with PTSD and survivor's guilt and all sorts of things. So she's a mess. And that's what's so much fun about and how Jamie plays it in the new film is just great. This movie has nothing, zero, to do with anything except Halloween 1978, period. Not even Halloween 2. The problem is this. You're John Carpenter. I'm Deborah Hill. We're writing a movie together, and we write a movie, and we come up with a story. And it turns out to actually do well. So now they are saying, well, we want you to do another one. But now it's just a bunch of other people's ideas. What if, what if, what if, and all those what ifs is what has filled 40 years. And I'm not saying that those what ifs don't have value. I'm not saying that the movies that were made about those what ifs aren't things that people love. Some love them, some may hate them, deride them, whatever. But they're not, there is no Bible. There was no big book like, oh, in sequel 10, Laurie is actually, it's just not true. It's all what if. I know. What if it's her brother? <sighs> that's good. Ooh, that's good. And you write a movie about it. What was so beautiful about the first movie is it was complete. You can't kill the boogeyman. It was the boogeyman. As a matter of fact, it was. That's beautiful. He's gone. Do 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 do. Just because what it's saying is, he's everywhere. He always will be everywhere. It's terrifying. So what's beautiful about the new movie is that it removes all. It just literally slices away all of those other movies. They exist, you can watch them, you can love them or hate them. There's 1978 Halloween and 40 years later. That's it. That's why this movie got me. That's why I said yes, because it made all the sense in the world. Take away any of the past and even address it in the script. You've seen the trailer. Andy is walking to school with her friends and Miles, Robin says, well, yeah, isn't it her brother? And she goes, no, that was something somebody made up. And done, you see, <sighs> gone. It's very clean. 1978 happened, and now 40 years later, 2018 is happening, period. Haddonfield was West Hollywood and South Pasadena in 1978, and Haddonfield is Charleston, South Carolina, and, uh, you know, Ashley Phosphate Road out in the boonies of South Carolina. So there is no real Haddonfield. Haddonfield was created to be all, every town. Laurie Strode is every person, every girl. And it was beautiful to return because the tree-lined street in Charleston was the same tree-lined street as in West Hollywood because you see that is ubiquitous. Babysitting is ubiquitous. Innocence, even though we are shifted in our innocence and the internet isn't helping, um, there is still innocence and there are still kids and there are still babysitters and people still maybe believe in that 
possibility. What has she taught you over the years? Self-reliance, resilience. Hmm. <laughs> okay, you can stop now as I start to cry. Thank you all very much.